Welcome everyone to the uh, the first session of the 2021 SOAS Central Taiwan Studies uh, Summer School. Uh, our first session looks at a really um, important uh, issue from the lens of Taiwan's um, environmental movement, and that's the issue of Taiwan's fourth uh, nuclear uh, power station. Um, and I think it's particularly important that we look at this topic because um, uh, there is a proposed referendum in the summer of, uh, of this year. And, and of course, it's a topic that we're coming back to. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's something that we discussed um, in our 2013 uh, Taiwan Studies uh, Summer School when there was also a proposed a referendum. But in that case, it eventually got um, uh, cancelled. I'm delighted to welcome two really um, important uh, speakers. Um, and I should say that I'm welcoming them back. Uh, our first speaker is Wei Yang, who was um, here in 2018 in our summer school when he presented on a round table on student uh, movements. At that point in time, um, uh, Wei Yang was a MSc student in sociology at the University of Oxford. And uh, since he graduated in 2018, um, he's been uh, back in Taiwan and he's been involved in the campaign uh, against um, uh, nuclear power in both the referendum campaigns of 2018 and uh, 2021. And he's been doing this um, through his role as a research fellow in the Green Citizens uh, Action Alliance. Uh, which is a environmental NGO that we've heard a lot about, for example, in the work of uh, Simona Grano, um, and we also hear about it in the uh, in the brand new book that um, uh, Paul Joban has edited with Xiao Xinhuang and uh, He Minxiu, which we'll be talking about um, uh, later uh, this uh, this week. Um, our second speaker is um, Simona Grano who's uh, one of the key figures in the study of environmental issues um, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, she teaches um, at the University of uh, Zurich and has also been very active in the development of Taiwan studies in, in Europe. Uh, through her role as the director of the Taiwan Studies program at the University of Zurich, um, and she's also um, been involved in the European Association of Taiwan Studies, hosting the, the conference um, in Zurich. Um, and um, we're delighted that she's actually joining us this year as one of our uh, research uh, associates. Uh, the other thing I should mention is that Simona is uh, the author of um, a very influential book, Environmental Governance in Taiwan, that was published in uh, 2015. And as part of this week's project, she'll be revisiting uh, that uh, book uh, six years after its um, its publication. Now, the format of today's session, we're going to first have a um, a brief uh, overview presentation uh, where we'll, we'll Wei will tell us a little bit about the history of the environment, the anti-nuclear movement, um, and the um, uh, nuclear power industry as well as where we are now, before we move to uh, discussion uh, with uh, Wei Yang and uh, Simona. So uh, now I'm going to hand over to, to Yang for your presentation and welcome back. It's great to see you again. Um, thank you, David, and hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me clearly? <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, it's my great honor to be able to um, uh, like talk to you uh, on this issue, and uh, it has been three years since I was uh, I was in the uh, in in SOAS and talk about student movement. And back then I was still still a student, <laughs> but now I'm a re I'm a research fellow in the environmental organization called GCAA. Okay, um, I'm sharing my um, my screen now. Um, can you can you all see it? If you can, just let me know. Okay, so um, I'm just going to briefly introduce the um, the anti-nuclear movement in Taiwan and uh, why we oppose to the construction and operation of the fourth nuclear power plant uh, in Taiwan. Okay, so first I just want everyone to know that this is the our our current electricity mix in Taiwan. So as you can see, nuclear um, takes up about 11% in our in our mix 
and coal is about 45%, and gas 30, 35%, and renewable together with the uh, pump storage hydro is around 6.5%, um, which, um, which may not look a lot now, but um, in, in our long-term energy transition policy, we want to increase the renewable percentage um, to 20%. And while the nuclear, uh, the nuclear will uh, gradually phase out um, to zero uh, by 2025. And the reason why I will just um, uh, brief, uh, briefly uh, explain later. And but uh, compared to the re uh, the phase out of nuclear power, I think the most most significant is the re reduction of coal power. We will drop it from 45% um, to to 27%. So this uh, significant. Uh, significant reduce. Um, meanwhile, we will uh, in, in increase the gas percentage to 50% as a intermediate uh, 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 electricity option. So we we currently have three uh, nuclear power plant um, in operation um, in Taiwan. So the 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 one in um, Jinshan, one in uh, Quoshan and one in uh, uh, Hengchun. Another one we are talking about um, this this August. Uh, the, uh, the referendum wants to uh, restart the construction of this one, the Longman nuclear power plant, which uh, we we usually refer to as the fourth nu nuclear power plant uh, in Taiwan. And so why um, why we will uh, why so a lot of people don't know why in 2025 the nuclear power in Taiwan will go will go to zero. Um, they, they they wonder whether that's the government just uh, set a day, an arbitrary date and say, OK, from this day on, we, we no longer want to use nuclear. But actually, uh, the date of 2025, no nu uh, a nuclear phase out is because um, the three existing nuclear and the reactor reactor will um, decommission, will all be decommissioned by 2025. As you can see, the um, uh, the first nuclear power plant, uh, they, the, the two reactor uh, were all decommissioned in 2018 and 2020, uh, 2019. And uh, this year, uh, the second nuclear power plant, the re first, first reactor of the uh, second nuclear power plant uh, will be shutting down um, this year uh, because the, the, their, the, fuel, the fuel pool uh, is already full. Can, there, there can cannot be any more new fields. So uh, you will shut down um, earlier than ex expected. Then the last one to shut down, the last one to be decommissioned will be the third nuclear power point reactor two. So the, the decommission date is 2025 um, May. So as you can see that uh, after 40 years of um, operate of, of operation, 40, year, 40 years of operation, um, all three existing nuclear power plant will um, be decommissioned by 2025. And the uh, number four, the fourth nuclear power plant, the Longman po nuclear power plant has not been um, uh, completed. So it's still under construction. So uh, uh, so even if the referendum passed this August, the, the construction will not be finished by 2025. So in any way, um, by 2025, there will be no nuclear uh, power generation um, uh, uh, naturally. So uh, ne next, I want to briefly introduce our um, anti-nuclear movement campaign um, in Taiwan. Um, uh, as, as you, some of you might know, uh, we Taiwan have went have been have been through a period of martial time where the government um, strictly prohibit uh, social movement and and protests and any sort. So until the late 1980s, there um, there hasn't there, there hadn't been much protest against uh, environmental issues. But um, in the late 19, 1980s, as the um, martial martial law period has ended, uh, we have this environmental movement beginning to protest against uh, nuclear power, especially the fourth nuclear power plant. Um, the Longman nuclear power plant. And so um, by by the year of 2000, that we have our first uh, political, um, uh, the, the, the Kuomintang, the KMT party has uh, stepped down. And so we have the first uh, power swift uh, switch uh, where in, in which the DPP has come into power. 
And so for a brief period, the, uh, the fourth nu nuclear power plant um, ceased to construct, but, but just for 10 months. After 10 months, the construction continued. So, um, and during this, all this time, there, there has been um, anti-nuclear movement, but not very, not very much. And I think it's after um, 2011, uh, Fukushima nuclear incident, um, after the, the incident had occurred, um, the anti-nuclear anti -nuclear, uh, campaign in Taiwan has um, become more and more popular. And a lot of en environmental NGOs formed the No, no Nuclear Homeland Alliance. And then since then, we have this um, annual abolish, abolish nuclear parade, or say uh, no, uh, no nuclear parade every year uh, since 2011. So as you, as you can see from the photos, um, a lot of people will join join the parade. Uh, and this is the Aboriginal people in the island of Lan Yu, um, where they um, they stored our, our low level nuclear waste um, in an injustice way. Okay. So um, after uh, the year of 2013 is prop uh, was probably the the high point of the uh, anti-nuclear movement in Taiwan. Uh, that year, there are more than um, 220,000 people uh, participated in the in the uh, anti-nuclear parade, and um, that is just including Taipei, Taichung, and uh, Kaohsiung, which is from the northern part, the, in the central part, and in the southern part of Taiwan. Um, all a lot of people all participated in in, in the parade. And so after that, hundreds of NGOs, including um, including the oh, sorry, did I did um, okay, you can still see the slide? Okay, it just had some technical problems. Okay, so hundreds of NGOs from the uh, National Nuclear Abolition Action Platform, um, my organization, the Green Citizens uh, uh, Action Alliance, also. Uh, also participate in in this platform. So since then, we uh, we were held the uh, annual uh, anti-nuclear parade every year, and also um, the anti uh, anti-nuclear referendum is also organized by the by the platform. And so in in the in 2014, there there was a eminent, a very popular anti-nuclear activist, uh, Lin Yixiong. He went into hunger strike to protest the con construction of the fourth nuclear power plant, and so he he hunger strike for almost I think it's like uh, two or two two weeks or so, and so um, uh, uh, a lot of people they were concerned about this thing. So about more than in in the in April twenty seven, more than fifteen thousand. Protesters occupy Zhong Xiao Xi Lu, Zhong Xiao Waste Road, which is uh, the main main road in front of the Taipei main station. is a very large and uh, important um, um, road in Taipei. So you can see that a lot of people occupy occupy this road, and they were <laughs> they were evicted by the government with water cannon. So this is a very very important and a major event um, in 2014. And after 2014. The government has announced that the um, has announced the the fourth the, the construction of the uh, fourth MPP to be to be put into hold and uh, so into sealed. So the the president announced the the Longman nuclear power station to be sealed until now. So the the construction stopped uh, by a stop uh, in 2014 and has not continued uh, and, and until now. So there's a there's a referendum in 2018. It's called Go Green with Nuclear. Is uh, this referendum was proposed by some pro nuclear um, activists. They the the referendum asked, Do you agree to repeal Article 95, Paragraph One of the Electricity Act, which says the nuclear energy based power generating facilities shall wholly stop running by 2025? Okay. Okay. So the reason there is this act. It's just like what I said. Uh, because by 2025, um, all the all the license of existing three uh, nuclear power power station will will expire. So will stop by they will stop generating power after 2025. So the people wants to take this um, this law away. They want to keep use. They want to keep using renew, uh, uh, re nuclear power after 2025. 
and then so they launched this referendum. And so the new the pro nuclear camp uh, say that they claim that nuclear is a reliable base low el electricity and which Taiwan clearly needed, as they say. And also they say nuclear is a low carbon electricity option, which can that can help us to uh, help us reduce our carbon emission. And they also think that um, the Taiwan's renewable renewable energy policy is too aggressive and it's not it's impossible to achieve uh, to achieve 20 percent by 2025. And, and so they say before our renewable energy is mature enough, we should keep using or even expand our, our nuclear power. And um, finally, the, the, they win, they, they won the referendum by um, that they have the 60, almost 60 percent of agree vote and the against vote is only 40 percent. So this act, oh, OK, this uh, this um, electric, electricity act Article 95, paragraph one, was removed, was repealed after the referendum. But this does not change the fact that um, the the license will expire. All the license will expire after 2025. So the the 2025 nuclear phase out is remains a de facto um, de facto uh, situation. So they want to launch another referendum this year is to um, re, uh, the construction resu resumption of the fourth nuclear power plant. Because as I just said, the fourth nuclear power, sta uh, nuclear power station uh, was put into a hold by the President Ma uh, in 2014. And people think, why shouldn't we just continue, uh, con 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 continue the construction of Longman nuclear power station? And after it's finished, we can put into a commercial operation so we can solve the, uh, the, power, the power outage or the air pollution or car carbon emission um, issues in Taiwan. OK, so this year we have this referendum. And next, I will just uh, very quickly talk about all oh, this is just I analyze why the Thai turn. And I think maybe we have time to talk this discuss about this later. So I will just very quickly introduce the reasons why we, the environmental organization, think that we should not use the fourth nuclear power plant. First is because the the Longman nuclear power plant station has been has been built for 15 years and has not the the, the, the construction has not complete and the construction is very floated. As you can see that um, during its construction, there are there had been um, over 500 of violation of regulation and some of them, uh, 15, seven of them is related with um, uh, 60, 62 of them related to reactor meltdown concern and uh, seven of them re related to radiation leak concern and there, there are this much total fines. So the, in, in short, the construction, the construction um, quality of the fourth nuclear power plant is very bad, and and even the pro nuclear expert, th those experts who um, support nuclear, they they all they all strongly argue against the use of the fourth nuclear uh, power plant. Another reason is that we think the that nuclear power plant is a financial disaster. Um, the fourth nuclear power plant. Originally, the, the the budget, the expen the expansion, uh, the expense was originally planned as uh, four billion pounds. I translate into uh, 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 pounds, but it ends up with more than seven billion pounds spent. So it's, it's even double double the, the expense, almost double the expense. And it, it is estimated that if we want to um, if we want to completed construction, we will have to spend another two billion pounds. So that will make the total construction cost up to nearly 10 billion pounds, which is um, very much. And um, without the fourth nuclear power plant, the, the commission waste management and disposal cost of the three existing nuclear power plant is estimated to be uh, around 12 billion pounds. So. So, and this is seriously underestimated. So if we add the fourth uh, nuclear power po uh, nuclear power, power plant to it, uh, there will it will be a huge financial burden to Taiwan. Plus there, the uh, geological condition is very unstable. 
uh, the Central Geological Survey under Ministry of Economy confirmed that there are there are votes vote, um, under and near the uh, the fourth MPP. As you can see, this red line is a fault. Um, just uh, it goes across uh, uh, beneath, just right beneath the the fourth MPP, and uh, the the offshore. There are five active active fault with total length of 90 kilometer uh, offshore of the MPP. So um, before the um, uh, should I say while the fourth MPP was um, was planned and then constructed, the, they didn't consider the um, significant risk. So they didn't anticipate that they will discover a active fault under and, and near the power plant. So if we want to continue the construction of this power plant, we have to reevaluate re or re and reinforce its uh, um, its uh, seismic coefficient. That will take time, and so it will take at least ten more years uh, for the fourth MPP to be uh, finished. Uh, so the end end means we can, we do, we don't know how much how long it will take. You have to renegotiate with the General Electric Company, and you have to sign a new contract. And some of the equipment you have to have to be up upgraded, and you have to uh, uh, acquire them. And you have to also you also have to go through some uh, legisl legislative process, including the budget planning and approval. And there are another five years needed to enhance some of your um, your constructions uh, to to meet the post Fukushima safety uh, enhancement requirement. And so together, they will they will um, take an, at least ten more years for the fourth MPP to be finished. So that can. So we think that um, by the time it is finished, uh, we can already develop uh, mature enough renewable energies. And this this power, this nuclear power station cannot help us to solve the power, the power problem or the carbon issues that we are facing now. And, to, and finally, we also have this nuclear waste problems that we and I think I think not only Taiwan, a lot of countries that use nuclear power still has not find a way to solve the nuclear waste problems. We have find a way to to do the uh, final nuclear uh, final nuclear waste disposal. And so together we think that um, um, we, we should we should uh, object to the, the the continue of construction of the fourth nuclear power plant in Taiwan. And that's the reasons that we are against this referendum. So these are my very brief uh, introduction of the why we oppose to the referendum and the the, um, the history of the anti-nuclear campaign in Taiwan. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, I think uh, as Wei Yang also addressed in his presentation, you have to look at it from the perspective of when I was working on the uh, movement and what it is now. So I think that you always have to see, I was there in 2011 and 12, right? So the emotionality of the Fukushima disaster, this was something that was present very much, even though I remember that even when I carried out interviews before at the time also there was a national election coming up in 2012 and I remember already talking to the people a bit about nuclear energy and right before the uh, Fukushima disaster happened in March I was already there for had been there for a couple of months and I remember that the people were quite pragmatic at least those that surrounded me at the time in also pointing out of course the problem of energy shortages right in Taiwan of course after that Fukushima took place and I think this is a phenomenon that you observe in many other countries not just in Taiwan that alongside the emotionality of the event and the terrible things that happened the um, sometimes even dormant anti-nuclear movements I'm not just talking about Taiwan I'm thinking about South Korea for instance enjoyed a revival right and as Wei Yang was saying then they were able to even make it into a yearly appointment so I would say of course that it really depends right now as he has addressed you have First of all, almost 10 years have gone by, right? And people unfortunately forget, even though they shouldn't, because the effects are still there. But the fact so we know that the media effect is not there anymore, the catalyzing effect. And furthermore, I would say that a few uh, things that happened in the past few years in Taiwan, including in 2017, the big power blackouts that you've had, right? 
prompted concerns in the public opinion and among the general population that Taiwan might really need, of course, uh, nuclear energy. And I think this sort of like problems such as air pollution and power shortages or supplies that are not enough, these really sort of like set a very good stage for pro-nuclear uh, groups, right? And uh, to go back to your initial question to me, I think at the time you didn't really have, when I was looking into, of course, the anti-nuclear movement, you didn't really have a pro-nuclear movement. You, of course, you had the government, you had Thai power and you, you had the lobbies, which were always pro-nuclear, but you didn't have a civil society movement that actually constituted itself, because I think that we need to look at it, what they are trying to do with this referendum. They're also trying to prey on topics that are presenting themselves as, an ally, as a sort of like a um, substitute and also a part of civil society but pro nuclear. So I think at the time you didn't have it, now you do. And this ties in nicely with the fact that the situation has evolved, has changed. Taiwan is a country that has very high intensive uh, energy production industry, right? Uh, semiconductor, uh, they all need this kind of energetic output. So I would go back to your, to your question and say, I think the situation has radically mutated also because of what has happened recently with the power shortages. And if I think about the last year and the COVID-19, uh, Taiwan, of course, has also seen now in the past month and a half that maybe people have to stay home, that, of course, then they need even more electricity. And I think all of these concerns, they feature in their minds. Fantastic. Thanks for that, um, uh, Simone, because um, uh, I think that's really interesting. You raised the issue about the, the pro-nuclear uh, movement, which uh, looks so different now to, um, uh, let's say, if we if we go back to that kind of those kind of key turning points in 2011 and uh, and and 20, uh, 2014. Um, and um, and the other issue, of course, was the is the uh, the referendum and the way that you kind of uh, view that uh, today. Um, in other words, do you actually see this referendum as being something that is actually uh, pro-democratic? Um, in other words, um, um, for so long, this was a goal of the anti-nuclear movement to have a national referendum on the fourth nuclear uh, power station. And we were talking about this back in 2013. Uh, so I was curious about how you um, um, understand this current, uh, uh, the idea of it being put to a referendum. You're asking me, right? Not Wei, uh, Wei Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, Wei, Wei Yang seemed to disappear there for a, a yeah. bit, so I, I kind of... Uh, I, have, I, kind of... Uh, I have a power outage of my, my notebook, so... <laughs> okay. That, that's fitting to our discussion. <laughs> power outage. All right, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, go ahead, I address Simone. first, or shall... Yes, yeah, go ahead. I'm not sure whether he heard, but you go ahead, Simona. Okay. So, well, the question was whether I think this is also, you know, a question that is pro-democratic because it's being put to a vote in a national referendum for Wei Yang and also the fact that, of course, the champions of the referendum tool were always the Green Party, right? So, and mm. this could now backfire. Well, I first of all, coming from, I'm half Swiss, half Italian, but I live in Switzerland since 10 years. And of course, you know, Switzerland is one of those countries where you have referendum or referenda on almost anything. So popular vote is always required and public opinion is always required. And so, of course, if you ask me whether I think it's a democratic thing, I think it is, right? Because people can actually give their opinion on a certain matter. In this case, what we see is what you mentioned, we have a reverse of positioning. So I think you can clearly see, first of all, that the Guomindang maybe was even surprised to a certain extent in 2018 that he could take advantage of the referenda issue. Because in that case, of course, very for a very low margin, but the uh, pro-nuclear lobby actually surpassed and, and uh, was able to be successful. And I think that the, the probably the Guomindang also sees this upcoming four referenda, not just the pro-nuclear one, but all of them, as a competition with the DPP. Mm -hmm. So whether it is democratic, I think, of course, people have the right to go. I think that is the problem that also ties in nicely with the fourth referenda question, right? Should you couple these kind of questions with national elections or not, right? And of course, both parties have different opinion on this. The DPP somewhat also backtracked. Huh? First, of course, they, they thought it was a good idea. Now, rather, they would keep it separate because it can be manipulated. Of course, the explanation is more that they see that polls 
station have to be open for longer if you held everything on the same day. Definitely, I think it is a democratic um, tool that you have at your disposal. Um, of course, people have to be mobilized and in a way you can say those who go to vote, they really care about the issue, right? They should be aware of that uh, if you don't couple it with the national elections. Whether it will, you, you mentioned one question to me in, an, in the email, uh, what I think maybe we will also discuss that later, maybe Wei Yang can also say something more concrete to that since he's been uh, living in Taiwan and I've been observing from afar. But I think whether also, you know, public opinion is in this matter, I, I gather, uh, some people vote according to party line, so they tow the party line no matter what. But there's still a quite a big portion of people that are undecided and pragmatic. And we'll be watching, for example, the kind of TV debates you mentioned to me mm -hmm. in an email, David. And those people who are not decided, of course, for them, it will make a very big impact how the two speakers are presenting the issues. And that's why, of course, it's important also that, you know, anti-nuclear concerns and uh, green citizens action alliances uh, are doing the, the kind of job that they are doing. I mean, of course, it wouldn't be my, my role to say whether I'm pro or against. This is an issue to decide for Taiwanese. But uh, the only thing I want to say is I remember very clearly the kind of interviews I carried out at the time. And the concern really was not just nuclear opposing nuclear power per se, but really the safety concerns surrounding the constructions of this flawed nuclear fourth nuclear power facilities for all the things he mentioned before. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Simona. Uh, uh, Young, at this stage, was there anything you wanted to respond directly to um, 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 in terms of what Simona had, had said? Yeah, so uh, I just want to make sure because I have missed a bit. Uh, so the question is about the uh, whether the referendum is a, a, a um, democratic tool or or is that okay? I think this is also a very uh, heated debate in Taiwan um, since 2018 because not only um, not, there, there there were not only the new poor nuclear referendum, there was also the referendum against same sex marriage as you might know so there there were there have been some discussion about um what what are the topics that can be um can be put into a vote and what are those that cannot be so um should we uh decide the uh, uh whether people can can or cannot get marriage with the referendum or is nuclear issue a issue that we can put into a referendum? And does that mean some of pe some people will have to bear the risk of nuclear um, uh, extent or, or, or nuclear waste? Can these things be put into a vote? So I think there are some, there have been some debate on that, but I, but I think in, in general, people are still think, people still think that um, referendum is a democratic tool. Just how can we make it better um, in terms of um, the topic selection and also the process? Because I think in Taiwan, the, 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 the time it, it takes from the, uh, the referendum being proposed and uh, um, approved and being and the, and the vote date is very short. So there, there isn't much time for the civil society to rationally discuss about the issue. You know, so, so within such a short of time, um, the, the political parties, uh, they, they, they have uh, bigger influence. So, so I think, I think um, under such constraints, the, the, the tool, this tool, the referendum, um, indeed, has, uh, indeed caused some damages to our civil society. But I think we are not against the, the, the tool itself, but, but we, 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 I think we are discussing that how can we make it better. So one of the things is we should not um, uh, hold the referendum in the same year as major major election. In that way, we can try to reduce the influence from the political parties. But I think I'm, I'm a bit um, pe pessimistic. I think, it, I think the, the influence from the political parties still, still exists because I think the structural problem is that Taiwan is is highly polarized right now. Um, and I think if, if we cannot solve the polarized po problem, then, then it would just go to extremes. Like um, the green, the pan green camp, the green voters, they will significantly um, um, 
like a vote against the nuclear. But the 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 the, the blue supporter will uh, significantly vote a, 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 um, in favor of the nuclear power power. So I think that they kind of become the the pattern. And if we cannot break the political structure, the polarized political structure, these things will just go on forever. And not, not forever, but just it will repeat itself. Yeah. So this is and, my uh, mm -hmm. brief response to the to this question. And I just wanted to come back to an issue, a kind of comparative uh, question, um, because you came back to Taiwan in time for the 2018 referendums. Uh, I was curious about how you compare the overall um, state of the debate um, on nuclear energy um, in 2021 compared to 2018. Um, uh, do you feel, for example, that the anti-nuclear movement has learned any lessons from 2018? Um, I was, could you kind of comment a little bit on that? Me? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, I think the situation um, kind of get a bit more worse. I mean, it's more difficult, should I say, because of the there 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 were two electricity blackout um, mm. in 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 the in the mid of May. Of course, that, that is not because there isn't enough power plant. It's, it's not because we, we don't have enough power plant. It's because of the, um, the power system lacks, um, lacks good management. OK, so but, but, the, but the public and the media, um, they won't interpret that way. They will say, see, because we that, 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 that's because we need nu nuclear, more nuclear power. So I think the the incident of um, of of energy shortage um, kind of uh, uh, have a very bad impact on the referendum, and also given that uh, we are confronting with some um, COVID nineteen pandemic outbreak now, <laughs> but of course the outbreak is relatively um, serious than before, but still not very serious compared to um, to some of the countries in the world. But still, people are. People now they they kind they generally ha don't have enough faith on the on the ruling party, so I think that together created a create a, a bad momentum for the referendum. I think the lessons we learn is that um, we have to go we have to try harder um, in 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 the among the young people because I, I think surprisingly. In recent years, especially among the young people or the students, they they are more and more pro nuclear. I think one of the reason is like uh, what Samana has, has said because people don't remember the Fukushima incident. Um, for the college students now, when Fukushima occurred, they were probably in elementary school or something like that. They, the the new the nuclear um, disaster is very far for them. And they they are more concerned about the the uh, power shortage now. So so I think we have to focus more on how to uh, communicate with young people. I think one of my experiences is that when I go to campus and give a speech, before I give them a speech, I will ask them, do you support or do you against the referendum in August? I think uh, um, like. Uh, only 14 or 15 percent of the students say they will vote against the referendum and uh, 20 percent, more than 20 percent will say they say they will uh, vote um, uh, uh, vote yes and about 40 or 50 percent say undecided. But after I give them some information about the nuclear power plant I just present to you, um, 40% say they will vote against. So I think that is a very uh, significant change that um, some people just don't have that kind of information. And if they do, I think their uh, attitude, their thought toward this issue will change. I think so that's what we are uh, we are trying to do. We are trying to um, uh, provide some um, very basic information um, to the public. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to come back to something that because uh, Simona mentioned uh, the situation in Switzerland, the fact that Switzerland is known as the country in the world that has the most uh, referendums. Um, I was kind of curious about um, whether having uh, multiple referendums um, at the same time is an issue in Switzerland, because that's clearly is a uh, an issue in the in the Taiwan case. We saw how um, 
um, that often voters would lose sight of certain referendum topics because, for example, in 2018, there was something like 10 referendums on the same day. Um, is that an issue in Switzerland? Um, that um, holding too many referendums on the same day um, uh, loses, allows certain issues to lose focus? Well, first of all, I hope I, I'm not an expert on Swiss politics, you know, <laughs> so I can only say what I observe and I have been socialized rather in Italy with that system. But uh, it is my understanding that actually that's not an issue here. Of course, it depends very much on which kind of issues you vote for. But there's never, mostly I would say, there's never just one issue being put to votes. Recently, I think it was on the 13th of June, we had quite few. Actually, one was about uh, uh, CO2, so the phasing out and, of course, of uh, fossil fuels and how to reduce it. And um, this was not together, but it was coupled with three more referenda issue. So I wouldn't say that this gets diluted if this is what uh, we are talking about because of the fact that you have more referenda question or topics being put to vote. I think it really depends also on who is the promoter, who is the proponent of the referenda question and how much they are able to convince the people about the validity or of course the opposing arguments and often for referenda topics here you have of course parties that are pro and con just like it is now the case for the Taiwan uh, pro or contra nuclear a topic that will send you leaflets at home, will try to convince you that we, you shouldn't do one thing because it would be bad for businesses. I'm talking about exactly this uh, more pro-energetic uh, pro lobby and, and the vote we had on the 13th of June or the other opposing side that will say that we can go by even if we accept the law, just Switzerland will have to impose higher, for example, taxes on airplane tickets so that you can reduce carbon uh, footprints and so on and so forth. So I, to go back to your question and be precise about that, I I don't think that the issue of holding more than one referenda is a problem. The thing is we vote also per mail, mostly actually people vote per, per mail. So you don't have the issue that was put to, you know, to the to the forefront in Taiwan of people going to the polling station and this taking too long because all of us receive a, a brief at um, I'm sorry, um, a letter at home and then you can decide, you get informed, you get a booklet from the government which will explain to you who called the referendum, what it is about, what the government would advise you to vote for or against and what the opposing or pro uh, committee will actually advise you for, right? So you can get informed about the issue even if you don't watch, for example, the news. You can try to make up your own ideas. They will send this in the four national languages. So I get mine in Italian and then you vote per mail. And I think that's actually a very effective way of doing it. Mm, OK, that's really interesting. Um, I wanted to kind of come back to uh, to Yang on, on a question about uh, the party's role in these uh, debates, uh, because um, um, we've touched upon the, the way that the KMT is allied with the pro-nuclear um, uh, movement. But I'm also curious about the role of the, the DPP. In other words, the DPP is the ruling party. It's traditionally anti-nuclear. Um, um, to what extent is the DPP actually involved in these uh, debates? Um, and um, um, uh, traditionally, anti-nuclear movements are opposed to government, but now you have, a, in theory, a pro-nuclear government. Um, um, and, and, and furthermore, do you see that their role is any different from it in uh, 2018, because my impression was that in 2018 the DP looked quite passive. Um, but uh, do you see that as any different in 2021? Okay, so um, I agree with your uh, observation that in 2018 we um, the NGOs we we think that the DPP should be more um, uh, active on the referendum issue. They were they were back then they were very passive. And and so we kind of feel like we are fighting a battle that that the defenders should be the ruling party. But why are we the environmental NGOs stand up to to you know like speak for the government? That that, that give us a that's kind of a weird thing. <clears throat> but I think um, <clears throat> I think one uh, the Duffy has pointed out one de dilemma that we are confronting that. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Not, not the, the coffee thing, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> um, we are defending a, um, a energy policy that is long been 
proposed by us, by the civil society, but now they are also part of the, the ruling party's policy. So people will be like, you are the, you are the fighter for the government. You know, they, they will, they, they don't take your credit. They, they think, well, what you say is, is because you are a green voter. Or the, 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 blue, the, the blue camp will say that. So I think that posed some, that, that posed some difficulty for the NGOs. And I think um, this year uh, in 2021, the DPP initially they they were um, more active, more aggressive than before. But currently, in the face of the uh, the COVID pandemic outbreak, they kind of you know cool down a bit. They want to the they want to play cold. They they don't want the uh, referendum to reach the threshold. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So if if the referendum um, don't reach the threshold, then it doesn't. It will be seen as a rejection to the to the to the referendum proposal. So I think that their strategy now is is a bit caught in between. Some of them in DPP wants to fight hard. They want to um, uh, they want to pass the threshold and also win the referendum. But some of them in the DPP are kind of uh, they say okay let, let's just just um, play low key you know you know we don't we we just let it slide you know we don't mm. want them to go uh, past the threshold i think currently the ruling party has divided into the two side and we as the environmental uh, NGO, we surely want we we want a clear win you know we want the referendum to be defeated um because the threshold is reached and the, and the, the and the against vote is 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 uh, is more than the yes vote, but I think the um, the political situation in Taiwan now is a bit complicated because we there there is also a discussion to postpone the referendum just mm -hmm. uh, just to uh, let you know because of the pandemic thing uh, we think we think some of the uh, government official think it's safer to postpone the referendum. I think that will pose some more uh, uncertainty to the. To the strategy of the ruling party. Hmm. Okay. Fantastic. Um. I'm just looking now at some of the questions that are uh, the, that are coming in, and I um. There's one uh, that is um, kind of building on this issue about the role of political parties. Uh, Lee Herfai has raised the question about the KMT's um, role, um, and it looks like that question is um, uh, uh, particularly. Uh, linked to Simona and that the question seems to be uh, why does the KMT seem to have picked up on the pro-nuclear issue and, and it reminds me of something that Hermin Shou touched upon I think in a recent um, I think it was a Taiwan Insight article he I think he pointed out that um, it looked like in 2016 that the KMT had accepted um, that the fourth nuclear power station wouldn't be built in um, yeah, I think Julie Lun had had taken that position in 2016, but when we look at 2020, then the KMT had come back um, uh, much more strongly in support of um, uh, nuclear power. So um, I mean, th that question could be to either of you, but I um, uh, I wonder whether Simona, you had any thoughts on the um, the KMT's seeming um, shifting position? Well. First of all, I don't know if I would call it shifting. Yes, of course, if you look back at this proposition in 2016, but actually of all the four referenda which will be held on August 28th, I think the only one where we see the DPP and the Guomindang not having shifted side is actually the nuclear one, right? Because if you look mm. at the first proposition for the Algae Reef and the construction of this receiving terminal for liquefied gas, here we had the DPP in the 90s saying no to it and now saying yes to it because, of course, it wants to phase out nuclear energy, right? So I'd say that the pro-nuclear camp is not that surprising to me. The fact that mm. the Guomindang, of course, is uh, together, standing together with pro-nuclear activists. After all, I mean, it was always uh, the case that anti-nationalist opposition could actually gravitate around the issue of anti-nuclear opposition already very back early in the 80s and 90s, right? And even before the lifting of martial law, where you couldn't really attack the government openly, but you could attack its environmental policies. So I wouldn't say that they, it shifted really, but I, I do agree that this sort of like seems to show a very opportunistic stance of the Nationalist Party. I believe that they have a lot of problems in attracting voters, attracting younger voters, and of course this ties 
together with the situation that they are observing in Hong Kong, which we see, of course, the catastrophic sort of um, uh, public outreach that the Guomindang displayed prior to the national elections, which led it also to lose. And I think that every time that they see that there is an opportunity for them to attract newer voters, they jump onto that bandwagon. And this, in my opinion, is a very good opportunity, of course, the pro-nuclear nuclear camp, because they think they can attract also uh, a, a bigger variety of people. But I would say maybe the last thing I want to say is the uh, tying into what Wei Yang was saying before. Um, it is actually a pity that Taiwan, and it reminds me a lot of Italy, has such a political polarized situation mm -hmm. because sometimes people don't go beyond the political polarization. And as he was saying, when, when you explain to people, for example, what the issue really are, it's not just about pro or contra nuclear energy, it's about also being knowledgeable about the kind of dangers that come with a project that was built for over 15, 20 years with different manufacturers and so on and so forth. And people often ignore that. And when you tell them, they are surprised, right? And the fact that, of course, nuclear act, I mean, anti-nuclear activists or green environmental activists can be accused of being, for example, pro-China if they dare to maybe stand in opposition to the DPP. I'm talking about the first referendum on the Algae mm -hmm. Reef. This really shows how much issue go beyond the topic per se and tie into really towing party line and really political polarization, which is a pity. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Yang. I think Simone has a very good observation. I just want to add, uh, add something that um, in terms of the role of KMT in this um, nuclear referendum, uh, I think something very interesting is that actually the KMT as their party has not um, has not officially um, expressed their their um, attitude. Um, actually, there are just some um, very hawk hawkish, you know, the hawkish KMT -er, they say we should support the um, the nuclear referendum, like uh, former President Ma or the uh, the former um, former council mayor uh, Han, and and just some of them they they will they, they have they have expressed uh, publicly expressed um, support for the referendum, but if you look at the mainstream in mm -hmm. KMT, the the dovish, the dovish, the not the not so hard, but you know the, those those KMT -er, they they refuse to take a clear stance on this this topic some of the um, local mayor like the the new the new Taipei um, new Taipei city mayor where the the fourth nuclear power plant situate uh, located uh, the uh, mayor Ho, mayor Ho, he still refused to take a stance he say well if we cannot handle nuclear waste, then we shouldn't talk about the uh, more nuclear power stations. So actually, I think something interesting is that there, there, there is a line um, inside the KMT party, and some of the people they want to side with the pro-nuclear supporter. Um, the 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 supporter is called the uh, there's there's a group that's called the Nuclear Mist Buster. Mm -hmm. Nuclear Miss Buster, Buster, they propose this referendum. So they side with the hawkish KMT politician, but but the other KMT politician, they don't really dare to um, take a strong stance on this 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 regard. I think I think it's a very interesting interesting thing. And I can see we've got a couple of questions that are raising the uh, geopolitics of the um, uh, nuclear power. Uh, issue. Uh, so, for example, uh, Raymond raises the question about whether, from the perspective of um, um, uh, energy security, uh, there would be any benefit uh, of having nuclear power. And a, a further question that Jacob raises is, um, um, since the nuclear power plants are run on computer programs, is um, uh, is there a danger of it f them falling victim to Chinese uh, hacking? So we have two potential um, uh, angles there. And I know that, for example, uh, Yang, you talked about uh, the need to renegotiate with General Electric if um, uh, they restart this uh, power station. So I was just curious about where, how important um, you see kind of international relations or geopolitical issues um, in the current debates. Okay, so I think um, the geopolitic and the nationalism issue are have always been 
um, been not central but important part in this debate. Um, like the, some of the pro-nuclear uh, uh, camp will say, uh, um, nuclear can help Taiwan defend um, ta uh, defend China invade uh, invade if if that happened because uh, the nuclear the, nu the nuclear power can uh, last longer than say natural gas. Um, so if there's a, 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 a war going on in the Taiwan Strait, then we can self self uh, self sustain for like maybe a, a certain period of time. But I think the there's also a question that if if there is a war or if there's a conflict, then our nuclear power plant can easily become the target. Uh, uh, for the Chi for the Chi Chinese government, I mean there is also a risk, right? So and and also if we want to um, increase our energy self, how do how, what's that? Word? Um, energy self um, and self content. Uh, currently, eighty about about ninety five percent of our energy rely on import. Rely on our um, eternal sources. So we want to we want to increase renewable. Um, that is because we we want to reduce the reliance on um, outer energy sources. I think I, I think that's also a good reason to phase out nuclear because in in nuclear you still have to rely on um, trade or uh, fuel import from other country. So I think long term long term. Um, what is good for Taiwan is still facing our coal, facing our nuclear, and increase our renewable energy. I think that is for uh, that, that is a good that is good for our national um, interest. Yeah, I think I will uh, just briefly answer this question because I think it's a very complicated complicated one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Simona, did you want to add anything on the uh, the international relations side of this uh, this issue? Did that, is that something that that featured? Uh, in your research? Well, so far, not that much, but I think that the situation is now has now changed, right? I mean, the geopolitical situation between China and Taiwan is increasingly more being scrutinized and with the kind of uh, aggressive, of course, uh, entering into the median line by the Chinese uh, fighters, you have more and more the situation of whether Taiwan is really threatened, of course, and could be uh, really having to fight off the Chinese in, in the coming future. And then I would say that if I had, maybe this is also a discussion we can have on Wednesday to revisit my book in a certain way, I would probably add a geopolitical uh, dimension into it. But the only thing I want to add to that, um, to, to what already Wei Yang said, which is very comprehensive, is that I read that one of the reasons why the DPP is pushing so far and so hard for the first referenda, the one to have this liquefied natural gas receiving terminal, is precisely because they think that it could also, of course, increase uh, a certain um, having more energy resources in Taiwan, right? Especially if we phase out nuclear energy. So I think the security um, dimension is really on everybody's minds, especially nowadays. And um, let me just kind of come in there because that, um, um, to a certain extent, most of the referendums we have in 2021 are uh, kind of pan KMT referendums. But the, the one on the Algal Reef um, one is a little bit of a, a different one. I was wondering whether um, as an environment NGO that pre presents any particular challenges. Um, um, I was wondering whether Young, you could comment on that. Yeah, the, re the first referendum regarding the uh, the Olga Reef, the, the natural gas reception station, I think that is a very tough question um, for the environmental NGOs because I think when we when we are talking about environmental NGO, people tend to think we as a as a whole, you know, like we are all environmental NGO. But actually, we we have different concerns and different um, areas. So some of the um, some some of the more more focus about conservation, you know, the the uh, the conservation of the um, Olga Reef, but some focus on energy transition, some focus on other environmental issues. And I think before before 2021, in, in 2018, we were all like standing together against this um, this uh, natural gas reception station on that specific site because we are not we are we, we all agree that um, in 
uh, just for now and for the um, in for the for the interim term for the near future we have you we have to use natural gas as the intermediate energy sources to phase out coal and phase out nuclear but we think that the site selection the site selection of that reception station is problematic so i think in in in, in 2018 and before 2018 we were all teamed up against this this um this plan but i think as uh, in this year, um, as the DPP government come up with some revised plan, you know, they have kind of a, um, they come up with some, uh, uh, they kind of uh, make the, 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 the plan, they re, re, repropose the plan so that impact, the impact, the environmental impact of the reception station um, could be smaller. And some of the NGOs have to say, uh, uh, they think okay, maybe that will they will do because the environmental impact and the concerns are limited to a certain certain level and and is not a total destroy of the Ogar Reef. But some of the environmental NGOs think well, now this this still unacceptable. You know, we want a total um, total uh, preservation, total conservation. And I think that at that point, we have, we as environmental NGOs have some internal um, disagreement. Um, but it's, it, it is not a total, um, uh, we are not like uh, breaking up, which we which, should which, which say that we have different um, thoughts on the strategy in, 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 uh, in terms of our, our, our energy transition strategy. And I think currently we still think that the 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 process of the 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 process of this reception station is not justice is is problematic. But we think some okay. So like GCAA included, we think that after the revise after the, the government revised the plan, it's it's acceptable. Maybe like sixty or sixty out of a hundred score, you know. But some of them think it's still like 45 or even 30 out of 100 score. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the problem here. And I think, mm -hmm. but we are still on the, on, the net, on the nuclear issue, we are still uh, on, the same, on the same team. Yeah. Um, I can see we have another question that is an interesting one that raises um, about whether indigenous issues are being uh, a part of the current debate because we are aware of the um, uh, nuclear waste site in on Lanyu has been a, a kind of a, a core kind of um, anti-nuclear um, issue. But I was, um, uh, I think Zurinka's question is is asking whether that is still part of the uh, debate um, uh, in 2021, or is that getting uh, forgotten? Uh, sadly, I think the issue of indi indigenous people. Has not never been the center of the debate. I mean, I think because the pro nuclear camp always say that, well, we have ways to deal with nuclear waste. You know, if the nuclear waste is proper, properly handled, it does not pose um, serious threat. So I think the public and the media kind of um, accept that that point because especially the nuclear waste on Lanyu is low level waste. So um, in the like in the mo in most of the time, um, there there isn't a nuclear, there isn't a radiation leak in a uh, 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 threat there. So the problem is mostly about the injustice process, injustice uh, situation you for for people to put nuclear waste on an island that never used even one degree of nuclear power, right? But I think in Taiwan, that kind of a justice issue is not the center of the debate because when you took when you talk about justice, um, the pro-nuclear camp will say, see, this is emotional and this is irrational. We are talking about science, hard science here. And if you bring justice in this debate, then that is misleading the, the point. That's what I say. So I think, Currently, in the public 
discussion or public debate of nuclear issue in Taiwan, it's very difficult to bring the, the aspect of justice to the center of the stage. You know, people are still debating whether the nuclear is cheap enough or how long it takes to build a nuclear power plant. You know, it's, it's all about the cost and the price. But of course, we think that justice is a very important issue. But sadly, um, the media or, or, or the public opinion really don't pay much attention to that. But, but we th of course, we think that it is very important. But according to the poll, according to the poll, people, people really don't think nuclear waste is really that big a problem. You know, if, if, we, if, if they have to concern about nuclear um, threat, it's about the, the risk of earthquake, it is a, the risk about nuclear incident, but not nuclear waste, because it's too far away. It's, it's, the, it's, it's a question about 100 year or 1000 year or 10,000 year. It's just out of their, their conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the problem that we are facing now. Um, I see that we have a, a question from Paul Joban, uh, who's one of our authors who's speaking later this this week. Um, Paul, did you want to raise a um, a question? Oh yes, um, thanks, David. Um, actually, I I would like to ask so many questions. Maybe I have to arrange a <laughs> meeting with Wei Yang. And thanks very much. First of all, thanks very much for this wonderful talk and and Simona also but very important point and, and so um, thank you very much for this discussion yeah um maybe just two points uh way on you mentioned uh several times in your talk and in discussion the importance of a rational discussion about all this and you uh, reminded us about the unfortunate results of the 2018 the referenda in 2018 uh, I guess, well, it's something I wanted to, talk, um, to bring in my talk on Thursday, but never mind. I, I, I think it's better if we, 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 talk, we talk about it now. I think I will make a brief analysis, but uh, to sum up, what, what I found out is that, uh, and, uh, and this included interviews with uh, um, uh, your um, friends from GCAA, um, they, show, they highlighted the difficulty for you to have a rational disc discourse because the elections uh, was, the referendum were mixed with the elections. And it was obviously, from my understanding, it was obviously a goal from the KMT unproposed, uh, unproposed to, to, to mix the, the, the referenda, not only about the nuclear issue, but also about the LGBT and, and all the, 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 was uh, multi, multi, it was a referenda, it was a multi questions referendum. So this makes, so complicated that uh, I remember someone from GCA mentioning that uh, when we were trying to you you and and, and other people from environmental uh, NGOs were trying to talk about the nuclear issue, people would say, "Oh no, I'm against LGBT," <laughs> you know, just, meaning that people were totally confused about the whole questions. And and I think in in the end, eventually, this was very helpful for the not for the referendum also, but also for the local elections. So hopefully this year, I mean, hopefully from your point of view and <laughs> maybe mine also, but well, <laughs> hopefully this year, the local election is disconnected from the referendum. Uh, so now I'm glad you mentioned that uh, there is a possibility that the, the referendum could be postponed. I, I guess the KMT uh, will, <laughs> will, uh, protest against this very uh, because yeah obviously now it's a good timing for them. I mean uh, given what Simona underlines the, the poor shortage and the situation of the COVID-19. So uh, yeah my question is about how can you you say that when you have an opportunity to talk with students you can reverse uh, uh, feelings and that's very important but from what I, I see, you have very, uh, you don't have so much opportunities. Uh, uh, thanks to David, we have this <laughs> not, a, not opportunity today, but I can see we have, we're only like less than 100 people here. 
recently, you organized wonderful talks with uh, Michael Schneider and Kevin Camps, and I attended all those, and they were so professional. I mean, and the more I listen to every event you organize, it's so professional, it's so rational. Every time you convince myself, and you know, I'm, well, okay, I can say you, I was, <laughs> I was already on your side, but <laughs> I don't need to be convinced. But every time, you know, the more I hear what you, you, you guys say, and the more I think it's so, it's so convincing, it's so, it's so solid, and uh, so from a rational point of view, everyone should be convinced that for sure we don't need nu another nuclear plant, and we need to stop them as soon as possible. The problem is that, as we see now with the situation in, of the pandemics here in Taiwan, I mean, compared to Europe, I mean, the situation is, is well, it, of course, we have, we have to be careful, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just incomparable. <laughs> and, but here you, you see our, our, our the, the two mayors from uh, Taipei and, and, and uh, Xin Beishu are, are taking profit of this to you know, to propagate all kind of fake news, uh, uh, very strange, uh, you know, either fake news or uh, or exaggeration, blatant exaggeration of the problem, or and and just people just forget that they these guys are not doing their jobs to prevent. Uh, so in this context, I'm just wondering how you guys from environmental NGOs can control this kind of irrational discourse. Either through cooperation with, uh, you know, people like on um, first day we would have Audrey Tank. Is that first day or Wednesday? Yeah, I just did. Did you have plan to collaborate with, uh, you know, uh, anti hacking platform or, or Gov people from Gov? Do you have any, uh, you know, how to? It's it's difficult to control fake news, but at least how to react or. Yeah, you know, a, a counter plan or to to react to this irrational discourse and narrative, which can you know just make things so blurry. Sorry for this long question. No, thanks, Paul. That was a really good um, uh, topic because um, this issue about um, uh, the limitations of more kind of rational uh, debate and the issues of. Um, fake information. Some we've been seeing on the vaccination debate in Taiwan uh, as as well. So I'm uh, uh, young. Did you want to respond to to Paul? Thank you. Um, okay. Um, thank you, Paul. I think this is a very large and a very complicated question. I think um, as a student in sociology, I'm also really <laughs> curious about like um, how can we deal with the the situation where uh, in civil society it is so difficult to um, to discuss a, a public issue in a rational way. And in, in, in most of the time, those irrational voices will package, package themselves as rational. So people will like, so if, if you look at some of the um, nuclear supporters, they will be, they, they will say something very irrational, like you only take three years to build a nuclear power plant or things like that and say, well, this is hard science. And you will find that the, the, the you will find that the discussion very difficult to continue, and especially with the like you said the fake news and uh, um, and and all the things. I think uh, for a as an environment as an NGO worker, I think um, I think it can be described as a bit desperate. I mean, we have to, we have like we, we we sometimes we don't find a way out. And like especially, we really rely on social media to um, to uh, for our in, uh, for our initiate um, for our, our work. But you you see that Facebook is really not a good good platform for public issue discussion. It's it's full of fake news and hate speeches, and sometimes people don't really like. Uh, I think Simona has has mentioned that sometimes environmental NGO will be labeled as um, communist, you know, like uh, you are socialist and you are you are not you are not pragmatic. And, and so it's really difficult for us to to um, communicate or, or to um, to talk about this issue with, uh, with the public with, pu with public. So our strategy now, our strategy now is that we we will find some online uh, key opinion leaders and we will team up with them to talk about the nuclear issue.
because to be honest, those some of the KOL they enjoy higher social reputation than us, than us environmental NGOs do. So our strategy now is that, of course, we are still trying very hard to do energy education online and offline. But I think, um, given that we really have not much, we really don't really have not that much time until the referendum. We we can only side up with the online KOL, which I personally really don't like this strategy because I don't think that is a very healthy way to do public discussion. That you have to rely on some celebrities to make you heard. I think that's some irony that, but but still, I think that's a dilemma that we are facing now, and uh, I. Um, as a social sociology student and as a uh, NGO NGO worker, I really don't see a clear way out of the dilemma. So, what I wanted to kind of return to an issue that uh, we planned to talk about, and that was about. I mean, even though it may not be particularly important, and that was the uh, televised debates about um, um, these referendums, because part of the referendum law is that there should be a a, a televised debate on um, uh, each um, uh, topic and multiple debates. And I remember back in 2018 um, um, that uh, your organization, the Green Citizens Alliance Action uh, Action Alliance, did join uh, the uh, televised debates against the um, uh, nuclear mythbusters um, uh, figures. Um, so I was kind of curious about um, whether these debates will be handled differently and also whether or not they actually matter. Um. OK, so uh, as for the debate, I think um, th th this year will be held differently than um, 2018, as I know. In 2018, the debate was like a back and forth, like mm. um, he said, he said uh, something and uh, then I reply 10 minutes, then he replied 10 minutes. But I think this year it will, the format will be like um, each, well, each, each speaker will have like 20 minutes and there will be no back and forth um, mm. questioning and answering. And answering. Uh, that's as I know. And I think there will be, um, so it's kind of like a two side give speeches individually and there's no, no conversation, and and so if you ask me about the the effect or or um, the quality of the de debate, I I really highly doubt it, because if you see because uh, in in the experience of um in, in 2018, uh, in like three or in in like within a, a week I think within a week there 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 were more than ten or twenty a lot of a lot of debates like like um, stuff in one week and people really don't have the time and energy to to um, to watch it all and to consume all the information and because of the time limit of the debate I think um, some people some some speaker uh, they were treated more as a performance than a debate mm -hmm. so it's more so the debate is focused more on um, exaggeration and uh, like like how you can attract eyes rather than given rather than giving um, uh, solid evidence and 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 like uh, uh, inter questioning. I think the the design of the debate is really really bad and and which will um, which will limit the possibility of public discussion and the understanding on the issue on the issue of nuclear energy. So I so to sum up, I really don't think that is a um, a good a good a good tool um, a good tool to uh, I mean debate it's not a really good tool to to enhance the understanding on this issue. And and Simona, did you want to come in at all on this this kind of um, communication or media side of these um, of the current um, anti nuclear campaign? Well, I guess um, I, it makes sense because uh, that they would now hold it in a different way, at least give more time to a person to present their own side rather than the bickering that we saw last time. 
because I think last time was also a lot of personal attacks, especially from the pro-nuclear camp against uh, your representative of uh, C uh, GCAA. And I think that was, even though you might have thought that is something that people didn't like to watch, but nevertheless, the pro-nuclear camp came through, right? Which also depends on, of course, that uh, I think 45% of the people did not go to vote after all. So um, that they would change the format absolutely makes sense. But I also uh, would agree with, with Yang. I also don't think it's a, a very good tool. It can really, in my opinion, and I think you see this even in American presidency debates, it can polarize already high emotional issues even more rather than empower people with information it can actually really make it into a sort of like a very ugly spectacle so according to who are the speakers of course and just a, a kind of a a, a follow-up um uh, issue that was kind of uh, linking into uh, some of the earlier um uh, chat questions was does do you see a role um, in terms of um, from the China side. So from the China side, we often hear talk, for example, at election time that China is is trying to influence Taiwan's elections through um, misinformation. Um, do you see that? Is that something that you have any sense of that that there's any kind of PRC involvement in these current uh, debates? Because I can see that from a PRC perspective, um, um, this kind of polarization is actually a positive thing. Um, 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 or is this just something that's in the background? I think the PRC information war, that's what we uh, in Taiwan we say it's an information war. It's not just it's not just on nuclear. I think it's it's more general. So mm -hmm. um, I think especially now during the pandemic time, I think a lot of fake news and uh, the polarizing um, uh, many uh, polarizing thing. Um, I believe some of them are backed by the PRC, but um, there are some people. A lot of people in Taiwan they are doing research on this issue, and they they will they, they actually they find some evidence on some of the major um, social media platform like we have what do we call uh, uh, the PTT is a bulletin board. The bulletin board discussion uh, is a very large bulletin board discussion um, platform, and also the DCAR. So some of the they found they they find evidence that on um, uh, in this in this social media platform there are some people who uh, are clearly like higher or they have some background can that can be linked to PRC um, mm. like fi uh, finance or something like that. But I think generally the I, I think PRC influences can only um, uh, explain just a partial of our current situation. I think the more profound or the deeper question, the deeper problem is that our po political structure it has long been um, divided along the, the, the line of green and blue. And I think that exactly because of that, so if that give PRC opportunity to manipulate your public opinion through mm -hmm. this information war. So um, so to sh um, to answer it shortly, uh, of course, I think there are some uh, the PRC plays some roles in this information war. But I think um, if we have um, 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 healthier politics, then and then then we can have then we will have a healthier civil society that can resist that kind of uh, manipulation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, um, I can see we have one question that, that we've uh, managed to miss uh, from Sue Jollo and she's raised. She uh, let me kind of uh, read her question. I'm surprised there aren't many KMT supporters who are concerned about uh, sourcing sustainable energy and by the real dangers associated with um, uh, nuclear energy. So I think Sue is really trying to get at the the idea of whether the KMT is um, um, uh, not also pro kind of renewable uh, energy. And and I guess at one point, for example, um, uh, Yang, you have touched upon uh, the fact that the current New Taipei mayor um, has a kind of a um, um, uh, a slightly blurred position on um, the nuclear power station. Um, I don't know whether uh, this is one that uh, Simona or Young want to respond to. 
In other words, um, uh, is the KMT position uh, quite kind of uh, clear cut? Is it um, or is it um, also open to um, alternative energy sources? Um, just to answer it very quickly, I, I, we, we don't think that the KMT has a clear energy policy framework. I think we, we, we have been criticizing that the, the KMT's energy policy is nothing but nuclear. So, mm -hmm. so now they, they, don't, they don't even want to take a stance on nuclear, then it has nothing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting that um, KMT and their, and their supporters um, have long been a like uh, they, they really doubt the development of renewable energy. They really doubt the potential of Taiwan de in developing renewable energy. So I think the so so you can see that um, the majority of KMT supporters they really don't think that we can achieve like 20% renewable energy in tw in 2025. And not believing it is one thing. But also, the, some of the mayor, local mayor of K, the KMT local mayor, they are, uh, as we see it, they are not, they are um, kind of uh, uh, stopping this from from achieving. So, like, they are not supporting uh, renewable energy in local level. They are, they don't really have a, a solid or or um, uh, making sense energy policy in local level. So, so I think. So, so we have been criticizing that their energy policy is really hollow. But, but so in Taiwan, you see a lot of people really, they are really questioning renewable energy. But I think that's really not the, like the IPCC has said it, like if we want to reduce the uh, carbon emission, we have to achieve at least 77% um, of renewable energy in 2050. And so that is that is something that we have Taiwan have to do. It's not it's not a partisan debate. It's the it's the task that we have to have to have to uh, encounter. But I think sadly in Taiwan it has become a really partisan debate, and uh, and the KMT and its supporters are really um, pulling pulling Taiwan back from this. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Simona, I can see we're almost running out of time, but did you have any um, uh, responses on, on this uh, question? Well, I would maybe just uh, end by saying that I think there are a few issues on which the Guomindang traditionally has a lot of issues in reinventing itself and detaching itself from them because of the tradition. And this is not just, for example, unification, but this is also, for example, the uh, support for nuclear energy. We know, of course, that well, the Guomindang is the the party that actually start, jump started it in the 70s, 80s, right? So I think there are some issues, and we have seen this difficulty that the party has in trying to give itself a new image that it really has problems in detaching itself from its past and of course certainly this is one of those and maybe finally to tie in nicely with the previous question that was asked to 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 young uh the political polarization issue and the influence by china um i think this is something that even though there is no direct influence on these specific referenda questions but as as young was saying there is nevertheless a very conscious attempt from China into influencing, of course, public opinion in Taiwan. And we can see that if the four referenda question would, of course, pass with a yes, this would be very problematic for the current administration. And in turn, this, this of course, would be very beneficial for China because the one hated enemy, the DPP, would be in trouble, right? Whether you want it or not, even though we know that referenda should not be taken as a sign of weakness or not for the party because there are a lot of other uh, topics and constraints. Nevertheless, we have seen it in 2018 as well. Of course, this is never a positive thing. So willing or milling, I think China's influence is there. That'd be my answer. And I just had one final question that I wanted to raise to, to, to Yang, because one of the things I remember from my uh, previous research was that um, when, for example, when the DP was in power 2000 to 2008 and um, environmental groups tried to talk to the KMT, uh, basically, they didn't want to talk because they would say, OK, you're a, a DBP uh, organization. Um, um, uh, and I mean, in many ways, your organization always seems to me um, very kind of um, keen to kind of show its autonomy 
from political parties. Um, is that uh, still the case? Will the KMT still not talk to um, uh, organisations such as yours? Um, uh, I think we, we still talk to KMT on, on, on many issues. For example, uh, currently we are we are uh, we are doing the uh, we want to we want to um, amend the, the, the what the act of the greenhouse emission regulation act. So we want to put the 2050 zero uh, net zero uh, emission into that that act. So mm -hmm. uh, we are we are talking. We talk, we have talked to a lot of uh, political parties. That of course, that in, uh, including the KMT, and so they also come up with their 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 um, their version of of the act. So I think this is one of the example. I think we can still have conversation with the KMT. It's not like we don't talk to each other. But I think the problem is um, if you talk to KMT on some issue, some of the media or some of the people will say, see, you lined up with KMT. So that that proves you are a, uh, how to say, you, 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 you betray Taiwan's uh, interest. You know, because some of for some of the green supporters, um, KMT is the opposite of Taiwan interest. And so, if any group dare to um, like discuss issue with KMT, it's kind of a betray. So, I think that is one of the difficulties we we, we face in Taiwan. And 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 the KMT, they are not really they they, they are not really concerned about your issue. Some, most of the time, they are just doing that because it, it, it suits their interest. So I think the environmental NGO are really caught in a very weird and a difficult situation that we want to push some issue. We, we want to um, uh, uh, make something uh, better. But if you talk to KMT, you will be attacked by the other side. If you talk to the DPP, then you will be labeled as a DPP sidekick. So mm -hmm. I think that is a really profound difficulties. Um, that we have long been <laughs> confronting with. Uh, fantastic. So uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, Wei Yang and Simona for sharing their analysis and experiences on this really important topic. Um, and thanks to all of you for some really great um, uh, questions. Um, let's give them a big um, uh, round of applause. Uh,